So hello everybody. Um, this is uh, part three of uh, chapter uh, fifteen, I believe. Okay, so um, there's this concept here in your book of a universe of universal banking, and and the question arises as to uh, what what is a uh, a universal bank. Well, you see, a universal bank will participate in many kinds of uh, banking activities. And it, it's at the same time, it's both a commercial and an investment bank, as well as uh, providing other financial services. Let me get rid of that. Sorry about that. <laughs> so they'll, they'll provide other services, such as insurance. So these are also called full-service financial firms, although um, they can also be full-service investment banks which provide wealth and asset management, trading, you know, underwriting, um, IPOs, researching, as well as um, financial advisory. So the concept is uh, pretty, is relevant, and in, in actually in the U United States and, uh, and in uh, England, it's, it's pretty relevant to have uh, um, basically these, uh, these universal uh, banks. Historically, there was a distinction, especially in the United States, between investment and commercial banks, there was an act uh, called the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, and this separated commercial and investment banks. In both countries uh, recently, though, since like around 2000, the regulatory barrier um, to this uh, combination of investment banks and commercial banks has pretty much been taken down. And uh, there's a, a number of universal banks have emerged in uh, both uh, lo locales. So, um, however, at least until like uh, around 2008, when we had the global financial crisis, there remained a number of uh, a large number of uh, pure investment banks, but little by little they're going away. So, um, universal banks and and what's called private banking, right, often coexist but can exist uh, independently. So the provision of many uh, services by universal banks can lead to long-term relationships between universal banks and, uh, and uh, firms. And there's a, a, a nice history uh, of, uh, of them. So I just wanted to make that clear to you what a, what a universal uh, what universal banking was. So you can see here there's a term here about coerce a borrowing or investing customer to buy insurance products. They try to sell multiple products. So uh, back in uh, around 1929, there was these hearings called the Pecora hearings that followed on the heels of the uh, Great Crash of 1929. And uh, it revealed numerous cases of severe exploitation of conflicts of interest in the banking industry. So uh, that went on and they were selling, uh, uh, uns uh, you know, shady uh, speculative securities. And the name they gave they gave these banks were banksters, I guess to you know combined it with uh, gangsters. So as I said previously, the resulting scandals led to passage of the uh, Glass Steagall Act in 1933, and this eliminated the possibility of these uh, conflicts of interest by mandating complete separation of commercial banks from investment banks. And that back in 1999, this act was repealed by Congress to enable banks to become uh, uh, more competitive. So um, there's always uh, incentives to exploit conflicts of interest in, in finance. There always will be. Um, and I, I don't agree with this, that it might not be. There's always a problem. And their reputations have been hurt many times. And they'll be hurt more. They still, uh, they still, um, they're very devious about what they sell to customers to try to make the best commissions. And you, you know, you could take some of this with a grain of salt, but I honestly believe that these uh, these places uh, they they exploit uh, a lot, and I exploit a lot of people. So in the short run, exploitation is possible, and I believe it's more possible than they say, and can lead to large gains. And uh, but basically, 
I think that's the way it is in this uh, in this in this. A lot of people claim that uh, the repeal of the last Steagall in 1999 uh, was a key event and a key cause of the financial crisis. So let's first try to understand what Glass-Steagall is. Glass-Steagall was a piece of financial regulation named after two senators, Glass and Steagall, that was passed in 1933 as, as part of a much wider uh, regulatory regime change uh, to really regulate for the first time, massively regulate Wall Street and control what financial firms could do. And the idea behind Glass-Steagall was to separate out um, the commercial banking activities of a bank and an investment banking activities of a bank. The idea is this. Commercial banking activities are basically receiving deposits and issuing loans. Uh, commercial banks like the bank of Wells Fargo and the banks around the corner that you see, or little community banks, they're all kind of commercial banks. What they do is they take deposits from lots of people and they make loans to businesses and individuals. Investment bank is deemed to be riskier. Uh, it involves underwriting stock and bonds. It involves uh, M&A activity, consulting, and to some extent trading on the bank's own accounts in financial markets. So in a sense, speculating. So it involves speculation in, in a variety of different markets. So the reason they wanted to separate these two out is the idea that Look, deposits are guaranteed by the government. We have the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, that basically guarantees deposits. Now, it used to be that they, they guaranteed only a very small amount. Today, they guarantee at least 250000 And if, you, if you're in a big bank that's too big to fail, they basically have guaranteed all of your deposits. So the idea is what we don't want to happen is that these deposits be then used for speculative activities on the investment banking side. So the cleanest and easiest way to do that is to chop them into two and say, commercial banks, all you can do, you get FDIC insurance, but you cannot use that money for anything but loans, as if loans are not risky and speculative, but put that aside, right? Investment banks, you don't get deposit insurance, so you can do all this other stuff, right? So you can, you can speculate, you can be more risky. Um, and, you know, that existed. So, for example, uh, just to give you one example, J.P. Morgan, the famous, famous J.P. Morgan, uh, had, had a very large bank. It was a commercial bank and an investment bank. It did both activities. And it was split in 1933 into J.P. Morgan, which was the investment bank, and Morgan Stanley, which was the, sorry, that, the, Morgan Stanley is the investment bank, J.P. Morgan is the commercial bank. Other way around. Anyway. It was split. <laughs> um, J.P. Morgan was the commercial, and Morgan Stanley was the investment bank. Um, what happened was that this division of labor just doesn't make any sense. So it's not anywhere clear that loans are less risky than, uh, than some of the trading that investment banks do. Just look at many of the real estate crises that happened during the 80s and 90s and where commercial banks were really, really in trouble. And the fact that they couldn't diversify across many, many areas really hurt them. And the investment banks did really, really well, and they were really not very volatile at all and didn't show any riskiness at all. So the whole question about whether this made any sense from a purely economic, even regulatory perspective was really questioned during the 80s and 90s, uh, where it was really the commercial banking side that was viewed as more risky. Another element of this is that Glass-Steagall, that separation doesn't really exist in any other country. So European banks don't have it, Japanese banks don't have it, Canadian banks don't have it. So the idea was American banks were becoming less competitive with the rest of the world. Um, so that's kind of, that's the background. Now, I, I'm putting aside the whole rights issue. That why is the government either getting into this issue? Why, why does the government telling bankers how to bank? And, and why is the FDIC insurance? The, the root cause here is the fact that the government guarantees deposits. If it didn't guarantee deposits, the excuse to regulate would go away. So put aside all of that. Um, just from a purely economic perspective, it was becoming clear that American banks couldn't compete internationally. And so there was a lot of pressure to repeal Glass-Steagall in the 1990s. And, and what happened is the first bank that really got into this was Citibank. Uh, the other separation, by the way, was uh, also you couldn't have banking and, and insurance companies. And there are lots of other separations, by the way. For example, a bank 
cannot own more than I think 10% of a non-banking entity. So an industrial company, and an industrial company cannot own a bank. So there are tons and tons of regulations dictating who can own what and how much and so on. And, and they, they are clearly detrimental to the banking industry and to capitalism and to freedom in America today. Okay, so in 1999, they repealed elements of this. They didn't repeal all of Glass-Steagall. They, they didn't, for example, do away with deposit insurance, which is part of the original Glass-Steagall. All they said was, okay, we're doing away with this uh, restriction about investment banks, commercial banks, and insurance company. You now can merge, and you can now run it all as one entity. We create a firewall between the funds that are part of deposit insurance and the investment banking business, so you cannot use deposit insurance money to speculate. right? Uh, but it can still be under one umbrella, one mother company. Uh, so in 99, this was passed. Uh, banks like Citibank uh, clearly combined insurance and brokerage and everything together. Uh, but a lot of other banks didn't. Uh, most banks, indeed, didn't take advantage. A lot of banks didn't take advantage of Glass-Steagall. Now let's fast forward to the financial crisis. There's no evidence that this had anything to do with anything in the financial crisis. So which banks got into trouble? Now, uh, IndyMac. Washington Mutual, lots and lots of little community banks. Guess what those are? Those are all commercial banks. They have no underwriting of securities. They have no uh, uh, investing their own funds. They have no speculation. They do loans. Most of the ones who got into real distress were more like SNLs. They did mortgages, right? So these are mortgage banks. So these are classical, traditional commercial banks have nothing to do with glass steel. On the flip side of that, what other banks got into trouble? Well, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, uh, you know, got into trouble, and, uh, and you know, a couple of other pure investment banks. They had no commercial banking arms. They had no deposit insurance. They had no, you know, deposits and loans. They had nothing to do with commercial banking. They had nothing to do with Glass-Steagall. The only bank I can think of that really got into trouble and that was a, what it, we'd call a Glass-Steagall-like bank had both commercial and investment banking is Citibank. Uh, so yeah, Citibank got into trouble. But Citibank would have gotten into trouble anyway. Citibank is well known for a serial bankruptcy bank. It, it was bankrupt in the 80s because of uh, Latin America debt and it was bailed out. It was bankrupt in December of 1991. Citibank was bankrupt, as were many American banks, because of, uh, because of commercial real estate. And it was banked up bankrupt in, uh, in 2009, 2008, because of the mortgage crisis. In all three cases, Citibank was bailed out. So, of course, w one could argue that when it was bailed out in the 80s, they didn't learn their lesson, and then they were bailed out in the 90s, and they didn't learn their lesson, so they keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. Nothing to do with Glass-Steagall. So this notion that somehow, because banks were allowed to do both of these types of activities, somehow that created incentives, there's just no evidence, nothing, not a shred. And I've challenged many economists who've claimed this to present me with one piece of evidence to suggest how this happened, how this is related. But again, Washington Mutual, pure mortgage bank, pure commercial bank, no Glass-Steagall implications. Goldman Sachs, pure investment bank, no deposits, nothing. Now, what's kind of funny is that in order to be bailed out, in order to get access to the Fed, Many of these investment banks today are technically commercial banks. They got a bank charter right in 2008, 2009. They were during the crisis, they flipped. But that was during the crisis that, again, had nothing to do with the causes of the crisis. So it's a myth. It's a myth uh, established by the left. It's a myth established because most people don't even know what Glass-Steagall is. It's a myth that works because most people are suspicious of banking anyway. Most people resent bankers. They, they find it a little mystical that you make money out of money. They resent it. Uh, read my article on, um, on uh, money lending, uh, where I describe this animosity towards bankers and towards uh, uh, money lending that goes way, way back, uh, t at least 2,000 years. Uh, so the left has capitalized on the ignorance and on the inherent, almost inherent suspicion of bankers in order to establish a complete and utter myth that has zero, literally zero empirical evidence to support it. Sure.
So I hope everyone enjoyed that uh, piece on the glass steagall like I thought it was quite interesting. And uh, I'll continue uh, with the uh, other 10 slides in this chapter. And, uh, and then uh, in part four, and we'll finish up. Okay.